Hi, it's Steve Hargit. Adam, I'm in. Lucy and I are in the offices of Edmodo in San Mateo. This is Global Leadership Day, our virtual conference. This is our second keynote. Fernando Ramirez and Connie Chung this morning started us off, and now Gavin Bikes is here with us. Welcome, Gavin. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Lucy. Shall I just go straight in, or are you? We're not seeing your video, Gavin. If you want to turn it on. I'm not sure anybody wanted to see my. Not yet. Give me two seconds here. Oh, we do. A special thanks to our sponsors and supporters. Uh, really, a terrific group this year. We're so excited. Um, especially appreciate VIF and Google, Wonderman, Edmodo, and Tez for really stepping up. And thanks to Iron USA as the founding sponsor of this. Uh, what are now a set of events throughout the year. So those of you who are participating live, this is your chance to indicate where you're located. You can click to the left of the map on the star icon, and you'll click on the map. You can also put a note in the chat. And for the sake of time, I'm going to move us forward, but please do feel free to keep making a note in the chat. Gavin, I hate to say it, but you may have made us international in this session. That's tr <laughs> I, I'm not sure my geography was right. Time of day, I think. <laughs> oh, good. OK, I'm going to turn the time over to Gavin, and then I'm going to uh, come back in when he calls for me. Welcome, Gavin. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and welcome all. As you see, I'm not in the Edmodo office, uh, but uh, rather in my front room at home. And uh, sitting in London, looking out at what is uh, quite a pleasant evening. It's uh, been a cold day, but um, is now a, a sunny or a, a, a cloudless sky. Anyway, on to the subject and matter, the, the subject we're paying attention to. How, how leaders behave, which I know is not a terribly grammatical title, but um, I hope you'll run with this. I recently spent some time in meetings at the OECD in Paris. Part of one of the discussions addressed how we should develop a vision for education, and in that vision for education, the importance having, of having a vision for the development of knowledge, a vision for the development of skills, a vision for the development of behaviors or character, and a vision for development of values. So knowledge, skills, behaviors, or character, and values. Uh, and it wouldn't be complete unless we had all those parts and we thought through all those parts. Then since that discussion, it kind of struck me that we too often uh, think of education as something separate on its own. And it's not. It's something that affects pretty much everything else. An article about Finland's social climbers uh, put it well recently. But uh, the article is Finland's social climbers, how they're fighting inequality with education and winning by Doug Sanders. And it was published in Canada's Globe and Mail. And it makes the point really well. It included a number of other good points. For example, stress does not create the best results. We think that school is for life, not that your life is for school. So this was reflecting the way that uh, things were approached in Finland. But referring more generally to Finland's extraordinarily successful education system, the article says it makes a lot more sense when you realize that the reforms in Finland's education system were not undertaken to improve educational outcomes at all, but to solve a social problem. So it wasn't just confining uh, educational outcomes to something which was very education focused, it was going much further. It, the, the idea in the reform of Finland's education system was to solve a social problem. In essence, and in history, Finland's population was beginning to divide into an urban elite and a poor rural population with little chance of moving between the two. Finland's response was to act to ensure that all children get the best possible experience of learning and school with, uh, 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 of, sorry, the best possible experience of learning and school with the intention of improving social mobility. And that's important because it gives real purpose to education. Education shouldn't stand alone. It is linked to employment and economics, to entrepreneurship and enterprise, 
and in a different way to illiteracy, crime and recidivism. Uh, so unless we get education right, we uh, may have a, an underfunctioning uh, economy. We may have a, 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 an undervalued and uh, entrepreneurship and development of new business. And we may just run into the problems associated with health and crime uh, uh, without ever fixing them. So education runs much further than the narrow confines of education alone. So we shouldn't box education into a self-serving corner. That's surely not good enough. In education, we should be working beyond its boundaries and influencing much more. So I wonder if, as we lead education, we shouldn't be working across government departments rather than working in education alone. We should be co collaborating with employers, and the private sectors, with social enterprise and foundations, with health, welfare, the courts, government. That seems to be much more appropriate to me. I believe this outlook has strong connection with organising education around student aspirations as well, uh, and point to Russ Quaglia's excellent research and his work in that area. Russ and Nicky Corso's book, Student Voice, The Instrument of Change, points to three guiding principles. Self-worth, when students know they are uniquely valued members of the school community. Engagement, when students are deeply involved in the learning process and that learning process is characterised by enthusiasm and a desire to learn. And purpose, when students take responsibility for who and what they want to become. But the point I really want to make here is that in order to achieve those aims, we need to listen. Indeed, part one of Russ and Mickey's book is entitled Listening. And that listening is a key behaviour or skill that our leaders should undertake. And we're not just talking about leading students here. We're talking the same is true for teachers and teachers' leaders. The OECD's Teaching and Learning International Survey surveyed views from 107,000 teachers across 38 countries and was published in 2014. One finding that particularly sticks in my mind is the connection between teacher engagement in policy development and decision making and their efficacy as teachers. So the more they are engaged in that decision making process, the better teachers they become. Much of this points towards leaving space so that people can develop into it. So it's not about filling curricula or filling time. It's about leaving the space for people, teachers, students, people generally, to make up their own minds, to come to their own conclusions, and not, not just filling up time for, for reasons because the time is there to be filled. Just as, it, as an industry, we increasingly see creative days when you work on projects that you want to do, so it should be for learning. So we should perhaps judge curricula less on what it include, what they include and more on the space that they leave. Leading is surely about setting conditions in which good work can be done, not stipulating and administrating, but motivating, engaging and inspiring. And so leaders' behaviours should fit that. So moving on to behaviours, an exercise that I picked up from a friend, Adrian Blight of Imagine Education, an exercise he often conducts is to ask each of us to think of our favourite teacher. So I ask all those listening, think of your favourite teacher. Now think of three words to describe them. I hope you've reflected on a few words that might describe that favourite teacher. When I've conducted this exercise with large groups and sometimes smaller groups and just in conversation, the kind of words that I hear are inspiring, creative, funny, supportive, caring. So let's go back to the where I started with knowledge, skills, behaviour or character and values. Those words like inspiring, creative, funny, supportive or caring, and I hope the words that you have chosen might be something similar. Where do they sit on that spectrum? Are they knowledge? Are they skills? I don't think so. I think they're much more likely to be towards the behaviour, character values, or, or the values part, which is at the, the lower end of the scale, and a bit which is 
to my way of thinking, much underused, much underplayed when we're looking at education. Reminds me of the uh, saying by Mary Maya Angelou, the civil rights activist, who said, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget the way you made them feel. I think this exercise of thinking of the words to describe people uh, suggests that thing is true. So where do we focus training and where do we focus development of leaders or, uh, in fact, development of any students? We tend to focus, I think, on the knowledge and skills part of the spectrum. And yet it is that behaviours and values part that is uh, that carries much greater importance than it's given. Could it be because behaviour or values are just too hard to teach and to assess? Well, I think that's true if you look at them in precisely the same way we look at knowledge. So there's a risk that we're, may, we're missing a really important part of learning by our focus on knowledge. There's a risk too that we might just be extending the knowledge-based methods of teaching and learning to skills, and yet in skills, apprenticeship has been shown to be a much better model. And when it comes to behaviours and values, it's about nurturing those behaviours. And use it, not using assessments in the way that we've done in the past, but finding new ways to operate. And perhaps we should be developing those so that we can develop the values and behaviours that we need, and we can develop the method, new methodologies for dealing with things. I, when it comes to uh, the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, I think we're into something similar. So thinking about uh, those seeking to achieve those goals and bringing those about through leadership. It's actually thinking about the values that are behind them, the behaviours that are behind them, is probably going to help us move uh, further in those directions. And I think what those UN Sustainable Development Goals allow us is an opportunity to actually do things that have real purpose, that have a real uh, impact on our lives. And so what I would encourage is us to look at the UN Development Goals as a part of education, and I think our leadership would do well to pick that up. So my last quote, perhaps, is from Amelia Earhart, the aviator. She said, there's more to life than being a passenger. And I'm trying to string all these things together now. The UN Sustainable Goals, we can either treat them as being a passenger or we can treat them as actually trying to influence them and bring them on and have an impact on them and through teaching and learning to do that. We, we, can bring, we can have a real impact on our world and I think we motivate our students and we motivate everybody when we give them that opportunity to have impact. So when I'm looking at and reflecting on behaviours of leaders, I'd like to see them first listen and listen to the challenges that we face, which may be encapsulated in those goals, and they may be something else. I'd like them to look beyond the boundaries of education alone, not just trying to achieve something like an improvement of grades, but actually improving the world, improving opportunities, perhaps improving society. And we need to look at the skills of collaboration and corporate cooperation and, it's, and the relationships with impact on society and on our world as a whole, world as a whole, if we want to have the greatest impact for education. As Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon we can use to change the world, and so we should. And that's really my thoughts on behaviour and leadership for education. Thank you, Kevin. That was profound. Uh, this is a point at which we're going to do a little Q&A. I'm going to ask some questions, but you're also welcome to put questions in the chat, and we will um, try and integrate those in. So, Kevin, we've been talking today, especially after the opening keynote, about the difference between globally connected education and global education. And I think the definition we would use for globally connected education is teachers in sort of a peer-to-peer -peer environment connecting with each other and good ideas bubbling up into that space you talked about. Whereas global education often has this sense of a certain group of people making decisions about what education should be and then sort of implementing on a broad scale. How do you resolve the tension between those two concepts? 
but I think the fundamental thing is that uh, it, it, in fact it's in some of those um, sort of like in Amelia Earhart's uh, thing, there's more to life than being a passenger. And I think you're a passenger or you're put in the position of passenger when you're looking at that, the decision makers making decisions and then you're just picking up on, on those and trying to learn them. Whereas the globally connected education means you're, uh, you're active. And I think there's a fundamental difference between those two approaches that uh, we really must take. And uh, my introduction of the uh, UN Development Goals is one, I'm, I'm keen on them because they create a real opportunity. We know there is purpose behind them. They don't dictate what we have to do. We don't have to follow that. And I think I would fight against any dictation of what has to happen. But what we each can do is to look at the circumstances in which we live and we can take steps towards them. By the way, just on those sustainable development goals, there's 17 of them. That's pretty hard to remember. But actually, if you if you go down to the roots of them, the roots are in people, partnership, prosperity, peace, and planet. So if you think about what you can do to improve those things, then maybe you can take action and then find ways to take action and for yourself but also give opportunities for your students or whoever you work with, your teachers if they work for you, whoever they are, so that you're encouraging that action amongst many of us in different ways. Again, I'm going to keep asking questions, but if you have a question for Gavin, please feel free to put it in the chat. <clears throat> Gavin, uh, what we heard from you and what we heard earlier today is, is this sense of the, um, valuing every individual student. So as you've worked with education leaders from around the world, to what degree does that represent a core belief or philosophy that really drives, in your estimation, quality output? I think it's absolutely crucial in, in and the best systems in the world value every student. The best systems of the world, we uh, will find out what it is motivates students and will bring them to give up their best and make their contribution. As soon as you um, disparage or uh, diminish the opportunity for any group, you're creating problems for, for the future. Uh, now, whether this works or not, I'm, I'm quite disturbed, I, I have to say, and one of the, maybe one of the big arguments that there, there could be is that uh, we're focused, at times, focus be, seems to be on the uh, some part of the community, maybe the most obvious one is where there's the gender divide uh, and in some societies and some circumstances gender, uh, one gender or the other, and I suspect you know which one is normally the case, uh, seems to have a greater focus and greater support. Uh, and I think that just is, a, a, is damaging. You are also not, when you do that, you're not um, giving fair opportunity to everybody. As a result, you are not using the resources that you have as a school, as a family, as a nation. And it's only when you begin to use those resources and you begin to use that potential that we will operate most successfully, in my belief. So that, uh, by, by whether you're doing it for a group within society or whether you're doing it for individuals within society, uh, if you are putting aside some people or not uh, giving them their opportunity and valuing them, then that's when we lose out. I just well, on this, I had a, a thing that was occurring to me, and I, I don't know if this is of interest to anybody, but they, uh, it, it struck me recently um, when we assess. Uh, in, in education, and I know it's coming down to a piece of detail. When we assess, it's so often that one person assesses another. And of course, when one person assesses another, our greatest problems come into play because that person's prejudices are naturally applied. When you get two people to assess, then you diminish the impact of the single prejudice. And if you get 10 people to assess, then you begin to remove the individual prejudice altogether. So I, I just wonder if there's something in that way of working that we should be doing more of when we're do, one when we're doing assessment, but also when we're learning and also when we're approaching and building what our education systems look like, the curricula and so on. 
Again, if you've got a question for Gavin, please feel free to put it in the chat, or you can raise your virtual hand and ask the question. Um, Gavin, we haven't heard much about the role of families uh, today. Uh, again, as you've looked at it, the broader picture, um, at least in this country, we have a sense that, that families are, are a pretty significant predictor of academic success. How have you seen countries uh, lead in regard to supporting families? I, I, I draw you know, from one example of um, that I gave earlier of Finland, which was actually trying to improve social mobility, which is a, a, a broader thing than just trying to improve the ind individual. It was actually dealing with a societal difficulty. So actually. They, they have demonstrated, if you like, uh, going beyond just the narrow focus of uh, education in determining uh, how, they, how they improve their education system and rebuild it. Uh, if you go to uh, Portugal, Portugal with the Magellan project, when, which was essentially uh, it is diminishing it, if you call it this, but I'll mention it just because it kind of puts it in a context. It was the one-to-one -one project where they um, gave to children in primary schools uh, computers and therefore and developed the work in it. But the way they worked was what, one in which they they didn't just think of it as being given to the pupils. They thought of it as being given uh, to the families. And they built the work around the families. So what they did was develop the capacity of the families to use the technology. And that development of that capacity was significant, made a significant difference to the way that Portugal regards itself and works. So I think it is, it's as I was trying to say in, in my few minutes at the beginning, uh, thinking beyond education's boundaries, thinking that you're actually seeking to do something else, working with families as a whole, and I think the, there is something which is um, something that is difficult in the school is is bringing families in. Uh, so, so actually, and I think too often it is done in the way that student voice is done when student voice is done badly. It's just doing simple little things and getting gathering a few opinions. If you're to do this properly, what you need to do is to work with the families, with the parents in order for them to actually help direct the school, help them be part of a board that is actually directing the, where the school moves. It's not just about getting simple opinions or getting them to help on a, a fun day at school. It's something much more fundamental, and that's basically hard work. It requires a lot of courage, uh, and it requires a lot of careful management in terms of actually drawing out the, the, the benefits that family can bring. The last thing I would say on that, you're absolutely right, that fundamental in, in inclusion of family is absolutely crucial, as I've said, and you've probably heard said before. Uh, if you want a child to have a good education, don't choose their school, choose their family. So I'm hearing sort of two very interesting themes that I'm so glad you're doing this, and I love any conversation with you, even a short one. You know, but one is how do you help a society or a culture get to the level of conversation that we are we, that you just provided us, right? Sort of the deeper conversation about what we are desiring and want. And then the next is how do you bring that down to the most local of levels, rather than implementing sort of blanket policies? Uh, I'm going to let you respond to that in whatever way you would like. We have five minutes left, and we do we did promise people that they could leave. So let's finish with this comment, and then we'll let people move on to the next sessions. I, I think the deeper uh, conversation and inclusion is actually not about concentrating power in the hands of a few. It's, it's actually about eliciting the agency of all the players. Uh, so thinking about the policies that elicit that agency. So the, the example I've given of, of, of Portugal was one in which that was done. The example of the way that education is organized in Finland is another because you're not concentrating power or the organization of assessments in one place. You're actually giving a lot of autonomy to teachers uh, and working on developing their professionalism in order to make those things happen. So the way that we get deeper conversations is to give people a, a part to play it, it, or allow them to take that part to play. 
Um, so it's not an imposition, it's something that they take on board. Uh, and I think that's the, the fundamental uh, way of making that work. I think I, I, if I have a minute more, I would just uh, two examples, two quick examples. When I was um, leading in a college or community college, and in that community college, we were um, uh, robbed one night of all the computers. And when I came in in the morning, the uh, student, sorry, the teachers there were in tears because the computers had gone. What the what we did then was to uh, we gathered the teachers together. We we negotiated with the insurance. We got the money for for a new set of computers. But then we asked what the teachers wanted and how they wanted to spend that money. It made a huge and significant difference because suddenly they felt agency and they uh, they were making the decisions. Uh, that engagement is was fundamental to actually how things moved and springboarded forward from there. Another one was in the I worked in one of the European countries, uh, a small country, on the development of its e-learning strategy. It, two times previously, a, a development of strategy hadn't seemed to work, and I was able to look at why. What had happened previously was that people had. Um, chosen what the, the 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 strategy for the way forward, and we're just trying, in a sense, to push that strategy forward. The way I was able to do it, because I'd learned from that past, was to engage conversation with students, teachers, parents, with the developing education community, with uh, leaders in schools and universities and in colleges, and to work out through them what their hopes and aspirations were for the use of technology in education and then to build the strategy around that. So it was their strategy and not mine. And again, I see that as the agency by the people that are involved. So that development of agency is absolutely fundamental. Yeah, that, with that, I should... <laughs> never enough time. Uh, so from your huge fan base here in San Mateo, California today, thank you for doing this. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. Thanks, Lucy, and thanks, everybody. Um, I hope you carry on a great day. Okay, on the next session, uh, we did have a cancellation in the next hour, so please refresh your calendar before you jump into rooms. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Kevin. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.